Uh, so let's just recall uh, where we left off. And that was chapter seven, which was about the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. And we talked about all the reasons why Jefferson was important as a president. Um, but the, uh, the chapter really ended with the war of 1812, right? And what that meant. Uh, in terms of the actual, uh, you know, fighting that took place in that war, you know, we can more or less say that it was a draw. Uh, and, and the reason for that was because there was no significant territorial gains or losses, right? Great Britain retained possession of Canada, the United States retained possession of all of its territories that it that it sort of outlined. So militarily, there's not too much significance to it. But uh, as I asked, you know, the two important consequences from that war, the first one was what we might call just kind of like a, a oops, I, uh, there we go. Uh, a new generation of leadership, right, emerged. Uh, we could say that this was the war heroes that were made. But, you know, we're, we're encroaching upon a time that war didn't end until 1815. That was the end of the wars for three years. But we're approaching a date now where a lot of the people from the Revolutionary Era, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, I mean, these guys were crucial to the creation of the United States and its early development, um, you know, they're, they're dying, they're, their time is numbered. Uh, and so the question is, well, after the generation that was actually there signing the Declaration of Independence, right, protesting the British, after that generation has gone and died, who's going to be uh, kind of this generation of new leadership? And during the War of 1812, a lot of leaders emerged in Congress, it was Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun who were the war hawks who really pushed for, oops, Calhoun, who really pushed for war against Great Britain. On the battlefield, it was Andrew Jackson who, with his victory over Great, or yeah, the British forces at New Orleans, turned into a, an American hero overnight, right? This guy became the most popular person in the US. So the War of 1812 is important for that reason. Reason number two was that it was an end to the Federalist Party, right? The two-party system, Republicans and Federalists, or Democratic Republicans and Federalists, really controlled uh, the political arena. Uh, but in the War of 1812, the Federalists spoke out against that war. They were labeled as traitors and would never win the presidency ever again. So that party simply ceased to exist. And we're picking up in this chapter, chapter 8, in 1815, which is sometimes referred to, as you see it uh, down here, the era of good feelings. And what the era of good feelings meant was that, well, on the one hand, even though the War of 1812 was more or less a draw, Americans claimed victory, right? So the era of good feelings was victory against Britain again, right? This was reason to celebrate. Uh, you know, British forces were pushed out of New Orleans. British forces were pushed out of Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, you know, both sides claimed victory. You know, if you ask who won the War of 1812, uh, depends on where you're at. If you're here in the U.S., the United States won. If you live in Canada, well, the British won, right? Um, so that was reason to celebrate. But reason number two, maybe more importantly, political division is over. And that was reason to celebrate. This image here is kind of a demonstration of, you know, you can see the good feelings being had by these two individuals who are uh, seemingly celebrating in the United States. You know, remember just how bitter and 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 divisive politics were in the early Republic period. Um, you know, I'd mentioned a couple of examples. Uh, the fact that John Adams did not, and I think this is this is true. I didn't actually look it up last time I heard it, but I, I don't remember where I heard it. Uh, but John Adams 
was the only president to not attend the inauguration of who followed him, except for what happened recently with former President Trump and President Biden. Uh, but also that you had the Secretary of Treasury being shot and killed by the former vice president, uh, you know, two political rivals. Um, now that the Federalists were gone, everybody's a Republican and political divisions are, are gone, right? They're over. And so that was reason to celebrate as well. However, as we'll learn, the era of good feelings is that the divisions are, are what, we, what we might say not on the surface. You know, on the surface level, everything looks good. But when you dig underneath, uh, we'll talk about a lot more divisions in American society. Anyways, this era of good feelings after the War of 1812 prompted the United States to invest very heavily in economic growth. One thing that the War of 1812 kind of made the U.S. realize in some ways was that the U.S. needed an independent economy. You know, it was good to trade with Great Britain, but if the United States goes to war with Great Britain every 25 years, which at this point, considering the revolution and the War of 1812 and all the other problems that the country had, well, it's not going to be good for business. And so the U.S. politically, or at least on a political level, really wanted to create an independent economy, a flourishing American economy that did not have to rely on foreign goods or foreign markets. And this was supported pretty much unanimously, right? You could imagine a Congress in which every single law, well, you guys probably can't imagine this, um, but use your imagination, uh, a law in which Congress passes pretty much every single law that, that goes through, right? There's no political divisions or there's no political um, arguments to be had. And so the effort to try and create an independent economy manifested itself in a couple of ways. Uh, the creation of the second bank of the United States this was part two of Hamilton's bank. Remember, Hamilton had set up a national bank in order for the United States to, you know, to, to be more economically active. The government could spend more money, could borrow money. Uh, that first national bank actually expired during Thomas Jefferson's rule. Or, or reign as president. Of course, Jefferson wanting to undo everything the Federalists did, so that makes sense. Uh, a protective tariff was passed. A tariff is a tax on imports. All right, that's a tariff. I think we've discussed what a tariff is. Uh, but again, a tax on imports, the idea is that if foreign goods are taxed at a higher price, more people will buy American. Think about something like iron. You know, if British iron is taxed at a very high price, that forces people to buy American being better ultimately for American businesses, right? That's the idea to try to foster, again, an independent economy. Uh, the nation wants homemade goods. And of course, what was crucial to buying and selling was transportation. And transportation was probably the most lacking in the United States. You know, if you think about the U.S. economy and even the colonial economy up until this point, uh, you know, we talked about in the last chapters things like the triangle trade. You know, all of the economic happenings in the U.S. were done overseas, right? It was tobacco from the South being exported. It was, uh, in some cases, the northern economies building ships for Great Britain. I mean, everything was export. Everything was export, import, export, import. You know, think about all the taxes that were passed during the colonial era, tea and, and all those other things. That was all connected to international trade. In other words, Americans had never traded with other Americans before. They had traded with British, they had traded with French, but never with each other. And that's because there was no way to get around in the country, right? And so Congress undertook various methods to try to improve this. The National Road was the first and only federally funded road network. And of course, this was designed to foster trade, 
you can see in this image here, it connected Baltimore, Maryland, which was an important route, right, for sea travel. And again, this was just like a road, uh, you know, to, to take a horse-drawn carriage across or walk personally. And it connected Baltimore through some pretty important cities. I mean, cities that aren't very important today, but certainly Columbus, Indianapolis. And the goal was to reach over on this side, the Mississippi River, which again was another area that you could have a lot of intense kind of commerce going down. So, you know, goods could be sent down the Mississippi, across the road, out into the Atlantic Ocean, or vice versa. And that was pretty significant. Um, it was the only federal road project because Congress got kind of hung up on passing further ones. Uh, instead, most internal improvements that occurred in the United States in this period were state funded. Again, in understanding the federal structure of the government, again, let's recall there is a federal government that is the government of all the United States. And then there are individual state governments. So when it came to transportation, the federal government built one road that connected all this here. Most of the roads were done on a state level within each state. And that ultimately made more sense at the time anyways, because states still exercised a, a pretty significant amount of power. Uh, so transportation improvements are slowly but surely Kind of making their way. Uh, one section of the textbook, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I do want everyone to be able to draw the connection between what is going on here with improvements in transportation. I mean, even think back to um, last chapter when we talked about uh, steamboats and eventually trains, right? So a couple. Um, government spending to increase tra transportation, couple that with improvements in technology. Later on, we'll talk about canals. And it just leads to easier access to the West, right? So as transportation improves, it makes it easier for the country to continue expanding westward. And this was especially in the case after the War of 1812, because the War of 1812 was also the defeat of many Western tribes, right? Think about Tecumseh and his uprising. And uh, even though the United States militarily was more or less a draw with the British, the War of 1812 gave the US the opportunity to go to war with a lot of these Western tribes to free up that land and that territory, throw down the improvements in transportation, make it easier to get there, therefore facilitating an explosion in westward migration, right? We'll talk about that a little bit more. So what exactly did this era of good feelings mean politically? It meant the ending of the first party system. Again, the first party system, Federalist and Republicans. Right, the Federalists were now gone and pretty much everybody belonged to the Republican Party. Uh, not only that, but successive presidents after Jefferson also came from the state of Virginia, uh, so much so that people described the presidencies of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, which by the way, were all Republican, right? They were also all from Virginia as the Virginia dynasty. It was almost as if, because there was very little political competition, that it was just going down sort of a dynastic line. Even though these people were not related to each other, they kind of all, uh, you know, they, they, they were all part of the same circle, right? That was until John Quincy Adams ran for president. Uh, he was the son of John Adams. And unlike the Virginia dynasty, was from the north, right? He was from Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Uh, and he ran for president in 18, I want to say 1820, let me scroll down here, 1828 or 1820, 1824. Right. 
So you can think of this, the Virginia dynasty here from Jefferson who won the presidency in 1800 all the way until 1824. That was all Republican rule, all presidents from Virginia. Uh, James Monroe probably best represents this era of good feelings. Uh, his election, there was only one of the electoral votes that voted against James Monroe. He was nearly unanimously elected as president. And I could say with utter confidence, um, although there were a couple elections in, in some recent history where it was close, but I can, I can pretty much say with utter confidence, there will never be a unanimous president again in US history. Maybe I'm wrong, uh, but I don't think that there will be. Uh, Monroe almost pulled it off. Washington is the only president to ever be unanimously elected. So that kind of gives you an idea of just how politically the country was, uh, was united. We'll talk a little bit uh, about John Adams here, or John Quincy Adams, uh, son of John Adams, the second president of the US. I believe during this era of good feelings, he was a member of this Republican party, but he kind of stood out a little bit as not being from Virginia. He was, I, I forget his uh, immediate position under James Monroe, maybe something like Secretary of State or an ambassador. But one of the things that Adams got done uh, prior to his ascendancy to the presidency, and this is what in part made him popular, was the Adams Onus Treaty. You can also connect in some ways the Adams Onus Treaty to this idea about westward expansion. And what that treaty did was it added. Florida to the US. All right, this happened 1819, I want to say. And of course, this was from Spain. And again, any sort of territorial acquisition was also reason to celebrate, right? So the fact that Florida was added, uh, John Quincy Adams was responsible. Again, I think maybe Secretary of State, whatever position it was. Um, However, though, this sort of frenzy for internal transportation, right? The idea of trying to, uh, you know, really invest very heavily and very aggressively into the US economy ultimately did lead to maybe some poor investments, some over investments. And in 1819, an economic panic uh, struck. So we might say over investments. You know, overinvestment is kind of a silly word. Um, we might think of it as over speculation, right? To speculate means that you believe that the price of something will go up. And so, uh, you know, all of this investment into these transportation networks got a little bit out of hand and led to economic ruin. Now, this is important. Because the Panic of 1819 and a lot of other panics, who it tends to impact the most is maybe what we might call the common class. And we're going to use this term to differentiate itself versus the elite classes, right? And what we're looking at between this division between common versus elite, oops. E-L-I-T-E, -E, is wealth, All right? So this is a, a class differential. What differentiates the commoners versus the elites? Well, it's wealth. And this is going to be one of those divisions that exists underneath the surface uh, in the United States, right? We'll go ahead and kind of highlight it here. Uh, it'll come into play. Uh, if we think about the era of good feelings, Yes, it's true. It was a, an era of good feelings for uh, everyone on a political level. But, you know, when we're talking about the Alexander Hamiltons, the Thomas Jeffersons, the John Adams, you know, even Aaron Burr, like, you know, those rivalries, I mean, they're all part of the elite class, right? And those fights really don't have too much to do with the commoners. However, you know, so, so when the Federals don't exist anymore, well, that's like, okay, all the elites are now united. But what this panic does is it really creates a certain sense of um, crisis among the common class 
who is hit the most, right, economically ruined. And we'll see how resentment from kind of this common class, this working class, whatever you want to call it, eventually uh, manifests itself, right? So pay attention to that. The second division, and I think, where did I, uh, here we go. I wrote it right here. We'll just go ahead and highlight this point to remind us uh, is that divisions are not on the surface, but they exist, right? And of course, one of those divisions is going to be our commoners and our elites based on the wealth. Another very important division, and this one probably you may have guessed it, is sectionalism. Sectionalism just refers to sections of the country. And in this case, you may be able to guess this, the two sections of the country that are divided are north and south, right? North and south. Again, we are going to go ahead and also identify this as one of the divisions in the country that is, you know, not on the surface. It's a little bit deeper. You know, this term era of good feelings has kind of come under a little bit of uh, scrutiny. Uh, because, in, in fact, uh, if we look a little bit deeper, we can see that it's certainly not an era of good feelings between all Americans. And by far the most important thing from this chapter is going to be the debate over Missouri, right? This is the most important part of this chapter. Uh, it's going to be on the test. Uh, it'll be on the test likely several times. But also, if you understand Missouri, you'll be in great shape to understand really the unfolding and outbreak of the Civil War, right? So let's talk about what the Missouri Compromise is. So Missouri, if you're not familiar, Missouri is a state. And in 1820, Missouri is ready for statehood. Remember that the Articles government set forward a plan for which territories become states. Once a territory reaches a certain population of eligible voters, it can apply to become a state. Missouri has reached that threshold in 1820 or 1819, but 1820 is easier to remember. Uh, reaches that threshold and now is ready to become a state. And the big question for Congress is, will Missouri be a free state or a slave state. And if we look at the map here, we can identify where Missouri is. Uh, the reason why it's a debate is because in this particular region, right, so this is Missouri right here. Uh, this region is part of the Louisiana Purchase. And if we think about the way that territory was added prior to that, right, these states up here, all right, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and eventually Wisconsin, these states were determined to be free by the Northwest Ordinance. Right? Uh, a place like Louisiana, which was added rather quickly, uh, there was pretty much little to no debate in this particular region. Again, in these states here, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, pretty solidly in the South, so slavery was going to be determined to be legal there. But in the case of Missouri, as you can notice, Missouri has a large border with Illinois, which is free, but also has a border with Tennessee. And so this question about Missouri being free or slave uh, sparked off uh, you know, an enormous debate within the country. Northerners wanted it to be free. Southerners wanted it to be slave. One obstacle for Northerners to overcome was that when Missouri was ready for statehood, there were slaves in Missouri that slave owners had already brought enslaved people in that territory. And so for Northerners looking to make Missouri free, the question was, well, what to do with these slaves? Uh, introduce Congressman Talmadge, who was a Northerner. He proposed the Talmadge Amendment, which said that Missouri would start 
as a slave state. Start as a slave state. But gradually, be free. All right, so that is the Talmadge Amendment. Talmadge proposed as a northerner. Missouri would start off as a slave state. That would solve the problem of slaves already being in Missouri, but would gradually be free. In other words, Missouri would follow a similar path than uh, most northern states did after the American Revolution. And that was once the children of slaves reached a certain age, they would be freed. Talmadge's proposal was rejected. It right? was rejected by Southerners. Didn't like it. And so the intense debate would continue. Now, ultimately, Henry Clay struck a compromise, which is what the Missouri Compromise would be. So we want to think about Henry Clay in this era as sort of a compromise guy. I mean, he seems to always be at the center of when the country is tearing itself apart, he's able to come in and create some sort of um, you know, agreement. And what they came up with is the Missouri Compromise of 1820, and here's what the Missouri Compromise did. So from this, you could probably already uh, tell Missouri, right? Condition one, Missouri would be a slave state. Right, so northerners, essentially, in in you know, in arguing over this, the North lost. Right. However, one of the concerns over Missouri was just not slavery. In fact, I would say slavery wasn't even the primary concern. The primary concern was political power, at least for those members of Congress, because what northerners feared was that if Missouri was to become a slave state. That means the South would get two more senators, right? That would represent Southern interests. They would get that many members of the House of Representatives, which would, again, uh, kind of steer the vote closer to Southern positions on particular issues, not just issues regarding slavery. It would give uh, Missouri the power to send electors to the Electoral College to vote for the president. And because of the three-fifths compromise, Depending on how many slaves were in Missouri, uh, Missouri would have all that much political power. So even at this time in the 1820s, uh, most Northerners didn't oppose, or at least most Northern politicians, didn't oppose Missouri uh, being a slave state because they disagreed with slavery as an institution or because they wanted to abolish slavery as an institution. Now, they might have wanted to do that. But the main reason why they objected to it was because they feared that the political power of Southerners was growing too large. And in fact, they had good reason to fear. The Three-Fifths Compromise gave the South disproportional political power. Uh, up until the election of John Adams, um, uh, sorry, John Quincy Adams, four out of the first five presidents were from the South. Uh, the Republicans had ruled for 25 years. Uh, you know, appointing who knows how many judges in the judicial branch, right? So there is good reason to fear. And so what Northerners got out of it, what the compromise part of it, was the creation of another state, Maine, which was free. This way, once Missouri became a state, they would send two senators, but Maine also became a state, and they could send two senators to balance it out. So adding Maine as a free state... And if you're not familiar, Maine is uh, up here in the north, right? This became a state right here. Adding Maine as a free state balanced out the political power. The last part of the Missouri Compromise was what's called the Compromise Line. And that was to settle once and for all the issue of slavery in the West. Or sorry, I take that back. That was to settle the issue of slavery in the Louisiana territories. And so Congress drew a line. This is the line right here. And what Congress said was that anything below this line would be open to slavery, right? So what makes up the modern day states of Arkansas and Oklahoma would be slave, but everything above this line would be free soil. And once these territories added enough people to apply for statehood, slavery would then be illegal in that territory. 
And so at least in that respect, the compromise line tended to favor the North a little bit more in agreeing that Missouri would be the furthest North that slavery would push. And it actually lines up pretty nicely here with the Mason-Dixon line in Maryland, which is also the most Northern point where slavery exists. So Missouri compromise, Missouri slave, Maine free, draw a line so this problem never happens again. So definitely know that because the problem of Missouri is essentially the problem of the Civil War. Uh, it just happens four years later and we'll talk about how that unfolds. But for the time being, any questions about the Missouri Compromise? Yes. Yeah, good question. So it's not really connected to the Missouri Compromise, maybe in sort of a, an indirect way. Uh, what the Panic of 1819 is mostly connected to is the investment. So first of all, it is, it's an economic downturn, right? So uh, the economy suffered, unemployment was on the rise, banks failed, businesses failed. And really one of the causes of that is up here, when we talked about kind of all this economic growth, and it was just kind of like the country and businesses and banks, um, you know, they essentially ate their ice cream too fast, right? They were so excited to invest in transportation businesses, so excited to invest in businesses out west. And a lot of those investments got away from them, you know, building roads that never really turned a profit or investing in businesses that never really uh, got up off the ground. So. Uh, it could be connected in a sense that what allowed for more people to move to Missouri was a lot of the financial requirements or the finances that led to the panic, but it's it's would only be connected kind of in an indirect way. Right. So you could think of it this way, like, you know, initially in the era of good feelings, there was all this optimism, right? This optimism about American businesses are going to thrive. You know, we just beat Great Britain again. We're building all these roads. We're passing tariffs to protect our business. You know, let's spend, spend, spend on American businesses. In fact, let's put so much money into them that it's going to be impossible for them to actually yield any sort of return. And then, uh, you know, at a certain point, the realization hits that you know all these companies are being valued at a lot more than what they're worth and it just kind of all comes crashing down right to reality you're welcome any other questions about e either the missouri compromise or anything else that we've uh touched upon so far okay and the point about the panic too is that who it ends up hurting the most is not the business owners, it's not the bankers, it's not the politicians. Who the panic ends up hurting the most are those commoners, they're wage workers, they're people who are now unemployed because unemployment is at 30%. You know, when a business fails, yeah, it might, um, you know, the, the business owner might lose a bunch of money, the investors might lose a bunch of money, but they'll be fine. Right? It's not like they're going to go starving in the streets. Who will go starving in the streets, though, is the person that worked for that business, right? that lived essentially paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. And so this really inflamed uh, this, this rivalry or competition here. So keep, keep Missouri in mind, right? because what happens in Missouri is very important in terms of what happens to the nation uh, moving forward. Okay, so we had said that uh, on the surface it was an era of good feelings, but you know if we scratch the surface or yeah, scratch the surface a little bit, uh, if we look at the wealth gap, elites versus commoners, if we look at the sections north versus south, things are not all that uh, all that well. Uh, the last maybe division that we'll talk about that things were again kind of getting away from the country is going to be the division between the federal and state governments, All right? We'll go ahead and throw this in orange as well. 
And that is to say there were some conflicts between the federal and state governments. Now recall that even though the uh, Federalist Party is gone, John Marshall is still the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he is a very strong Federalist. And all during the 1800s, the 1810s, the 1820s, I mean, when we said last time that members of the Supreme Court are there until they retire or they die, they really are, right? You know, the, you know there have been some Supreme Court justices and, you know, and, and John Marshall, the Chief Justice, who served for generations, right? I think just recently with the passing of, well, actually, I don't know, I'd have to check, but, you know, it could be generational, right? A Supreme Court justice serving for pretty much someone's entire, entire life. Uh, and over and over and over again, uh, John Marshall established the primacy of the federal government over the states. That's in any sort of ruling. And there was one Supreme Court case that had to do with banks. You know, they created a second national bank. State banks in Maryland protested specifically, didn't like the fact that the national bank had a uh, sort of privileged sta uh, status. And in those rulings, John Marshall favored the federal bank or the federal court system time and time again. Another very important court case in which we'll talk about more, not next week, but the week after, was the court case of uh, Worcester versus Georgia. And this had to do with the right for Georgia to remove the Cherokee, Cherokee tribe, the Cherokee Indians, uh, off their land. Right? So this court case was challenging or did challenge the right for Georgia to remove the Cherokee, right? Writing's a little bit sloppy, off of their land. Uh, so in this case, again, you have kind of three different kind of power sources at work. You have the federal government led by John Marshall. There's the state government by Georgia. And then there's the Cherokee. And the thing about the Cherokee is that their land is inside the state of Georgia, but they have a peace treaty, maybe not a peace treaty, but they have a treaty with the national government. You know, recall we talked about the principle of nations within a nation. Well, the Cherokee nation is a nation within the state of Georgia, within the, the you know, the, the um, uh, United States, right? And in this court case, John Marshall once again rules in favor of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis in favor of the Cherokee and against the state of Georgia. This is not the last time that we'll talk about this court case in particular. We'll revisit it again. But for the time being, do know that, of course, the Marshall Court is willing and ready to support the federal government over any challenges by the states, right? So just think about those as some, again, kind of the divisions in the era of good feelings, commons versus elites, north versus south, federal and state government. Uh, one other sort of key termish sort of thing that you should know from this chapter is Mon the Monroe Doctrine. This has to do with foreign policy. We don't really talk about foreign policy too much in the early years of uh, the United States because the US had a lot of internal problems to take care of. And the United States really didn't project kind of the same influence and power that it would in later years. Uh, but the Monroe Doctrine was somewhat the beginnings of kind of a more active American um, engagement overseas, or uh, technically in this case, it's not overseas, but engagement in other nations. Uh, what had happened between the 1800s and 1820s in Latin America was various revolutions. You know, in the same way that great, or sorry, in the same way that the English colonists revolted against Great Britain, you had countries like uh, Mexico, uh, Colombia, well, yeah, Colombia, Argentina, Brazil. Between the 1800s and 1820s, all these countries went through revolution, and all of them claimed independence. 
right? I mean, you could practically say that every five years or so, there was a new country popping up in Latin America, uh, successfully fighting against the Spanish crown in this instance and declaring its independence. The Monroe Doctrine, named after President James Monroe, the fifth president of the United States, was kind of like a, a symbolic solidarity between the United States and Latin America. Uh, it was celebrating the fact that both the U.S. and Latin America had gone through these revolutions which got rid of a monarchy, right, and put together a form of democratic government, which was the case in Latin America. Most of those, pretty much all of those governments were at least temporarily democratic. And uh, this was also in the same time kind of a way for the U.S. to flex its muscle. Essentially what the Monroe Doctrine stated was that Europeans... Uh, should stay out, you know, whatever stay out means, of the Americas. All right, so the Monroe Doctrine is a doctrine that states that European powers should stay out of the Americas, illustrated by this political cartoon here. Probably better gives you an idea of what the Monroe Doctrine is supposed to do. In other words, North and South America, Uncle Sam is saying, stay away, right? And what the U.S. really feared was a little bit less that Spain might come back. Uh, that was a possibility. Spain might try to reconquer their territory. Uh, but other more powerful nations like France and Britain was really what the U.S. feared. And the last thing the U.S. wanted was Britain and France to continue to encroach in the Western Hemisphere. It's um. You know, it, it's a good key term to know. Again, that Monroe Doctrine, that's going to be something that appears like on a matching question for your exam. Like you got to know the definition of it. And if you know it, you can get it, you know, answer it pretty easily. Uh, historically speaking, though, it, it really didn't do much at the time. I mean, the, the, the brutal truth is, is that the United States was too weak to enforce the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, it was kind of all bark and, uh, and no bite, but it existed. Right, it existed. Any uh, any questions so far? Okay. So uh, why don't we go ahead and wrap things up here with the last section, and uh, this will kind of be a good segue into what we end up covering in the next chapter, but that is the revival of opposition. And what we mean by that is political opposition. Now, we had said how the two-party system already went down to one. There was no political divisions there, but that changed in the election of 1824. The election of 1824 was essentially a four-way race. Uh, presidential election. Amongst those who were running included Andrew Jackson, who again was the war hero. And most importantly about Andrew Jackson was that he represented the quote unquote common class, right? He was running as the kind of ordinary citizen president. He wanted to get rid of policies that tended to favor the elites like banks, businesses, politicians. Andrew Jackson was different in that he was born, uh, was not born in the 13 colonies. He was born in Tennessee. He grew up on the frontier. There's questions as to how exactly literate he was. I mean, he was not very literate. In fact, one of the people, or, or two of the individuals that he was running out running against, one was John Quincy Adams. And the other one was Henry Clay. Right? There was one other candidate running, but he's not important. Um, and so one of the things that contrasted Andrew Jackson, especially with John Quincy Adams, was that, you know, Adams was an intellectual. I mean, you really couldn't get more elite than John, Adam, John Quincy Adams, who was literally the son of a former president, educated in Europe, right? 
And one of the campaign slogans in the election of 1824 was, vote for Jackson who, could, uh, who can fight, not for John Quincy Adams who can write. In other words, the fact that Jackson was barely literate was like a good thing, right? It meant that he, he sort of represented more of what the voting uh, class did. Now, there were also changes taking place to voting laws, which we'll talk about uh, again differently. Uh, but uh, John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay, what they supported was something called the American system. And again, this is going to be a key term that you want to be familiar with. The American system simply just refers to any internal improvements, right? So a lot of things that we outlined earlier that the country was building, right? The second bank of the United States, protective tariffs, building transportation, all of this would fall under the category of the American system. Like if we just wanted to describe all of that, we just say the American system. And politicians like John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay said, I support the American system. I want, you know, I want more transportation improvements. I want more in terms of uh, you know, extending the National Bank. I want more in terms of you know, John Quincy Adams in particular wanted to build a bunch of lighthouses on the coast of the US, again, to make uh, overseas commerce easier. Uh, Andrew Jackson came out against the American system, right? And this is where some of the pieces start to uh, kind of fall together. Uh, recall that in the panic of 1819, um, you know, a lot of people became unemployed and disaffected. And from an outsider's view, if you look at the American system, it is an alliance between politics, right? So the politicians pass the laws, right? Banks, which benefit from the laws that politicians create, and then business, right? So we have what sometimes I like to call kind of this unholy alliance. It's the alliance between politics, banks, and business, and of course, what they all have in common is that they are elite. And while the common class got the short end of the stick, right? They lost their job, they lost their homes, they lost everything. Uh, politics, banks, and business, as symbolized through the American system, is everything that the common class resents. And so Jackson runs on this platform of like literally burning the whole thing down, right? Against the American system, against politicians, against the bankers, against businesses. It's a disputed election. Jackson wins the popular vote, right? So more people vote for Jackson and gets the most electorally, right? So the most electoral votes, but not, and this is in the Constitution, a majority. So to be the president, you need to get a majority of the electoral votes. Jackson didn't do that. So as a result, well, then who decides who the president is? Well, then it goes down to the House of Representatives. And it was in the House that John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay, who were both running against each other, made a deal. And this deal was known as the corrupt bargain. Because as much as Clay and Adams were rivals, the last thing that they wanted to see was Andrew Jackson, who they considered to be a, a savage barbarian, that was the last person they wanted to see as president. And so the corrupt bargain was Clay gave his votes to Adams, right? And just like that with Henry Clay, Henry Clay also got a, a very prestigious position in John Quincy Adams' cabinet. Now, of course, Adams and Clay denied that there was any sort of deal but supporters of Andrew Jackson said, look, this just, the fact that Jackson could get the most votes and the most electoral votes and still be cheated out of his position, this only further uh, solidified uh, the belief here that everything was corrupt, right? The political system was corrupt, the business system was corrupt, the banking system was corrupt, that even democracy itself was corrupt. And so the fact that Jackson was cheated 
out of his uh, presidency, which he was. And this is a political cartoon of, I believe that's Henry Clay, on top of Andrew Jackson, sewing his mouth shut. In other words, Jackson will not be heard. Uh, that really led to the effort to re-elect Jackson in 1828, in which Jackson won, right? So four years later, the supporters of Jackson, uh, angry at this bargain that gave Adams the presidency, led to Jackson's election. You can see in this political, or sorry, in this map here, all the blue states voted for Jackson. This is 1828, so you can see that the support for Jackson at the time was uh, very strong. Uh, during that campaign, things were very ugly, right? The 1828 election was ugly. Again, the accusations against Jackson was that he was a murderer. Uh, they brought up his uh, record as a general and the way that he had you know, slaughtered people. They called him you know, an, an illiterate barbarian. Uh, supporters of Andrew Jackson said that John Quincy Adams was you know, uh, out of touch. He was elite. He was uh, a know-it-all. Uh, he didn't represent the American people. And one of the people who was targeted during that 1828 campaign was Jackson's wife, Rachel. So Rachel was the wife of Jackson, who during the campaign died, right? And, and that becomes significant because Jackson blames the death of his wife on his political opponents, right? His political rivals in the country. Um, Jackson, Andrew Jackson married his wife, Rachel, when she was still in a marriage with her previous husband. Uh, you know, that was, you know, just that itself, right? The fact that uh, she had not secured a divorce from her previous husband and married Andrew Jackson, you know, that was illegal at the time. Um, but it was even just especially taboo to marry twice in one's life. And so the press really treated Rachel pretty badly, you know, calling her, you know, you, you know, you could probably imagine the, the terms and stuff that they called her. And, um, you know, the story goes, and whether or not this is actually true, is that while she was browsing a, um, you know, like a store in Tennessee, she picked up a newspaper, read a story about herself that was so egregious, so hurtful, so harmful that she died on the spot. And for that reason, Andrew Jackson blames his political opponents, right, those that went after him during this election for the death of his wife. And during Andrew Jackson's inauguration, he dresses up in all black to mourn uh, the death of his wife. Uh, it happened between the election and the inauguration. And so he's going to go after his, um, you know, he's going to go after his political opponents pretty, pretty intensely. Um, and, you know, chapter... Uh, what are we on? Chapter eight. Chapter nine, we'll talk all about Jackson's presidency, right? So we still have a lot to say uh, about that. But he wins this election of 1828 after having previously been, uh, been cheated. Uh, there is one more thing that I want to touch upon here, uh, only because it is mentioned in this chapter. We'll talk about it more next chapter. But is the tariff of abominations. Recall John Quincy Adams was a supporter of the American system. Uh, let's use yellow. So John Quincy Adams, when he did become president in 1824, was a supporter of the American system, which amongst other things, included things like tariffs, right? Protective tariffs. So Adams passed, or the Adams administration, continued to pass tariffs that did not sit well with all parts of the country. In general, tariffs and not just the tariff of abomination. So this was what Southerners called tariffs. I'll talk more about it. Uh, but the point is, right, and we'll go ahead and illustrate this here. Uh, let's say we have two different factories. All right, we've got to have a smokestack. Again, this one's going to be England. This one will be the US. They both produce iron. When opened up for foreign competition, the United States produces iron that costs $2. 
England produces iron that costs $3, or sorry, $1, right? So in this circumstance, people are gonna buy it from England because it's cheaper, right? And without any tariffs, that's pretty much what was happening. Well, what does that mean for US businesses? It's not good, right? So this is where you slap on your tariff. And then you say, if England has to pay $2 more in a tariff, well, then that's gonna make their steel more expensive, or sorry, their iron more expensive, and more people are gonna buy American, and that's good. And that's how tariffs work, right? And so they should be supported, at least in theory, by most American businesses. Because in this circumstance, right, one plus the two, and then US, because Americans don't have to pay the tariff, you know, it makes it cheaper. The problem though, is that it has a different impact on the rest of the country. So if we look at the North, they have, right, factories. The South doesn't, right? The South is mostly agrarian, right? They have uh, uh, mostly farmland. And so with the tariff, what it means for the South, before the tariff, the South can buy English iron for uh, $1. After the tariff, the South has to buy it for $2. Now it's better for the industries, right? The American factories are better off, but there's no factories in the South. And so for that reason, generally speaking, Southerners did not favor tariffs because it just meant that they had to buy more expensive goods while Northern uh, factories benefited. So this term tariff of abominations is again what Southerners referred to as uh, what, what they called the tariffs at the time. And 